Thanks, Maggie. Um, people know what the University Health Network is? Toronto General Hospital, Toronto Western Hospital, Princess Margaret Hospital. What am I missing? Toronto Rehab, the Michener Institute. So yeah, we're the largest health science center in Canada, a uh, big research group, and, and I lead uh, a few of these, healthcare and factors, the health innovation. And um, my background is biomedical engineering, and, and um, I've uh, spent my entire career in the healthcare setting and buying technology, tens of millions of dollars of technology every year that UHN buys. Um, we help design technologies. Uh, many of the technologies that um, some of you, we, we evaluate them, we help uh, companies design new technologies. Uh, I'm personally saying as a biomedical engineer, I'm uh, conceding here, confessing, that I've created bad technologies over the course of my career that have victimized clinicians who had to use them. And I've learned a lot over the last 20 years of my career and this video probably will not work. Yeah? Want to try it? No? Well, what, would you, what you would have seen is uh, a number of vi videos from our lab of people struggling to use health technologies. And we've been at this for 15 years doing usability testing and evaluation of health technologies. And it's, uh, it's a shame because I think people had great ideas and maybe didn't execute or had b bad ideas that really probably shouldn't have come into a hospital. So, you know, we struggle with this all the time. And um, I have to tell you that we still see a lot of terrible products. And, you know, we're kind of looking to you to improve the situation. Nothing other than electronic health records are a big problem. Right? It's kind of like stepping back into the 90s, right? And we, for some reason, buy these things and spend tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in putting them into our hospitals. And it's not the only reason, but I believe it's contributing to physician burnout. They're spending more time doing data entry, toiling away at a computer than patient care. Um, and it's no wonder these interfaces are bad. And, and you know, in the, in the U.S. it's gotten so bad that they've hired, started hiring these guys off to the left here, scribes, professional scribes, so that the clinician could go back to doing patient care and they have a dedicated person that is uh, transcribing what's going on and entering it into the electronic health record. How damning is that of your product that you needed a dedicated person? Right? There's 40,000 of these people employed in the U.S. now. Something that the, health, the Canadian healthcare system could never afford, the idea of having professional scribes. Um, and, you know, scribes, hey, it's restoring joy to the practice of physicians, but it's not, it's not really a tech solution, is it? But look, everybody's really happy with the, <laughs> with the scribe there, right? Um, the other strange thing about technology, and, and everybody maligns healthcare because we still use the fax machine, right? So I was uh, in this, this museum in France, in Paris, and I saw the fax machine behind glass. <laughs> and, and yet there are, like you step into any clinic, uh, especially a family doctor's office, the fax machine is just rolling, right? <laughs> now is that because healthcare is antiquated? that we're Luddites, that we don't embrace technology? There is some of the most advanced technologies I've ever seen are within hospitals. Think about radiation therapy, linear accelerators, the, the, the cancer therapies, cardiovascular devices. We are not Luddites in healthcare. But why does this device still exist? Privacy? Uh, it's not very private. Yes, thank you. Um, this standard, I, I had to dig it up. Why is the, the fax machine so successful? It has this T4 ITU standard, right? And um, it's interesting. Fax machines work with any other fax machine in the world. That's pretty good. They're very simple to use and they're cheap. How much does a fax machine cost? $100, $200, right? Now, I would argue that if your fax machine was elect like an electronic health record, it can't connect to any other fax machine. 
it would take you months to learn how to use it, and it would cost about $10,000, right? <laughs> That's kind of the state of the art. Uh, I mean, electronic health records are a real burden on the system, and, and there's only incremental improvements to what we're seeing there. And even the most innovative companies, uh, everybody heard about the new announcement, right? This incredible watch um, can now do a single lead ECG, right? In the US, not in Canada. Um, it can detect atrial fibrillation, which is a serious cardiac connection, uh, a condition that would affect about 1% of the population, right? Problem is no one asked for this, let alone the healthcare system. We do not need AFib screening at population levels. <laughs> no one asked for this. So um, it's great that it exists, but even with the most sophisticated artificial uh, 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 intelligence, sensitivity, and specificity, there's going to be so many false positives when this thing comes out. You're only going to hear about the positive anecdotes about someone who was, who was saved because of the Apple Watch, but there's going to be many people who worry unnecessarily and get treated when they didn't need to. So, I mean, there's a real disconnect between even the largest companies and what's needed in healthcare. Honestly, I, w the thing that I loved about the new Apple Watch is it has fall detection. Now, it it's also cost $600, so there's cheaper ways of doing fall detection and, and probably Jay's system is, is probably a lot more cost effective than strapping a $600 device onto the Apple Watch. So what to do? Now, the problem is, is that healthcare is opaque and, you know, I think what, what Jay and Tim are doing in terms of engaging at the clinical level is a really important example because really the only time you get these really close insights of what's needed in healthcare is by being embedded to being part of the health system and partnering because healthcare is opaque. It's not, you can't assume what's happening in healthcare. It's very complicated. The workflows, the interactions. So I encourage you to, to be partnering up with healthcare organizations. This is some of the work that we've done in patient self-care. NED for prostate cancer, BREATHE for cardiopulmonary disease, MEDLEY for heart failure, I can cope for, for children's pain, and BANT for diabetes. I'm gonna talk a little bit, and this is a class of new uh, apps that are coming out that are, are digital therapeutics that we're actually gonna be prescribing to patients. And uh, heart failure is a big one. We have, uh, you know, the average lifespan of someone diagnosed with, with uh, heart failure is only 2.1 years. And they're heavily hospitalized. It costs the, uh, the health system billions of dollars. And, uh, you know, it's really great working with the top cardiologists in the country at Toronto General to get the level of insights that we need to build the best product possible for these patients. And so this is what we created, Medley. Is, uh, and this is now going back almost uh, 10 years of research and demonstrating the ability for uh, these mobile health apps to, in this case, improve hypertension management. And then we did another study here, a randomized trials that demonstrated its ability to reduce hospitalization and have improved health outcomes for heart failure patients in a randomized trial that we did a number of years ago. Now what does Medley do is it, it captures some of the most important parameters necessary for heart failure management in the home through your mobile phone. So it connects to a, 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 blood, a blood pressure monitor, a weight scale to see how much fluid is building up on the patient. And it, it also uh, uh, points the patient to answering these series of symptoms questions. And it goes into this algorithm that is based on the experience of all the cardiologists and heart failure specialists in, in, uh, at the Princess Mar uh, rather at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. And so this algorithm is extremely sophisticated in terms of uh, advising the patient on what to do and advising the clinic. And you know what? It's, it's also got this other feature. Does it have AI? No, it's actually 100% AI free. <laughs> it's totally based on the experience of heart failure specialists. And th that's important because once you introduce this to another heart failure specialist, they need to understand how the algorithm works and how it might need to be tweaked for their patients. But with AI, as, as you know, it's a little bit of voodoo in there. No one's actually sure how it's working, right? That's the beauty of AI. So this algorithm helps the patient self-manage. It helps alert the clinic as necessary to avoid the patient from being re-hospitalized. And as a result of the fact that the patient is doing so much more self-care and they don't need to be referred to the clinic, the ratio of health provider to patient is really quite stark. 
A conventional system is maybe 1 to 25 or at best 1 to 100, but Medley can do about 1 to 300 patients. So let me use another example, lung, lung disease. So this is Breeze for COPD, car, uh, car, um, a ser very serious um, uh, respiratory condition. Breeze was originally a, an app for asthma, and now we're extending it to COPD. And, and the patient goes through this process of putting in their inhalers and their medications, and it, then it, it acts as a, as a bit of a coach, as a, as a respiratory educator by prompting them through a chat bot that seemingly like they're, they're interacting with a respiratory educator. It's a bot, it's not real, but at least it seems that, that, that that's happening between the them and the interface. They are uh, reporting on symptoms and the medications they're taking, and then it goes to another part of the, the technology which is based on the Canadian Thoracic Society's action plan. It's an algorithm that is sanctioned by this group in Canada, and it's quite complicated, right? This is the algorithm that the, all the data from the patient goes through. And is it AI-based? No, it's 100% AI-free, right? <laughs> Again, because it's based on what we know about the best and optimal management. And again, we can show this to another respirologist and say, this is how the algorithm will work for your patient. So all I want to say is that we need to embrace technology and not revere it so much. Let's not just cheerlead technology. There's still lots of uh, work to do. We need to, as a, as a healthcare provider, we, we need to stop buying unusable technology and certainly technology that's not interoperable. And the last thing I have to say is you guys are very brave to be in this space. Healthcare is really, really tough, unlike any other industry. And um, I mean, I've dedicated my career to it and I greatly respect the people that work with me, the, the 120 people that work with me at UHN. Uh, between the operational group, my students at the university, the healthcare human factors group, which is the design group, and then eHealth Innovation, which is the group that develops this technology. And yes, we're hiring. So please drop me a line if you're very interested in doing some of this work. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Yep. Uh -huh. Question, is this is, you're calling this a digital therapeutic and not a medical device. So what are the regulatory requirements around a quote unquote digital therapeutic, especially with the patient data that it may or may not contain? So um, Medley is, uh, a type t is, a, is a class two medical device. I think we can say that finally, right Mala? I mean, we try to avoid it, but um, I think there's no, there's no stopping it. And, and, you know, this was an eventuality, I think, is that we went through uh, and adopted ISO 1345 about four years ago because we knew that these apps would, would be, um, get to the level of sophistication that they would qualify as a, as a medical device uh, eventually. So um, all these other applications are sort of uh, waiting in the wings and as their level of sophistication increases and they do are doing more decision support and taking some of the, the uh, decision making out, out of the hands of, of a, a clinician, then they would be at least a class two, if not higher. So that's, yeah. Uh, so you showed approximately three different EHR programs as an example of what's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big fan of learning from other people's mistakes, so mm -hmm. what was the process that led to these particular buying decisions? And it might be a very broad topic, but uh, if you can't answer in 15 seconds, maybe you should have another talk about that. Okay, so I mean, um, there's not a lot of choice left of the major ambulatory um, like there was a lot of consolidation. Um, a lot of U.S. hospitals have adopted one of three major electronic health records. There's not a lot of space for innovation. There's a lot of risk aversion uh, when you're spending upwards of a uh, hundred million dollars, like SickKids recently spent. Um, you know, Partners um, Healthcare in, in Boston spent upwards of 
It's either a billion dollars or $10 billion, but I don't think it matters when it's up in those range. It was a lot of money. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the problem now is there is a lack of choice. There's legacy issues and there's a, a paralysis around making the wrong decision. And it's kind of like buying Microsoft now. Not, not to disparage Microsoft, but it's a safe bet, right? So, uh, I mean, that's where we set. So you talked about UX most of, most of the time. How do you decide what's good UX, what's bad UX, and what research goes into that decision? So I mean, um, unlike most of the other industries, like the FDA actually mandates, it's part of the regulation process now, is that you need to demonstrate that through the user experience and the user interface, you're not going to harm a patient. So there is actually really strict regulations for medical devices now uh, from the FDA. And that's, that's actually informing a lot in the medical device space. Unfortunately, it doesn't extend to a lot of health IT. So I mean, uh, a lot of clinician frustration that we see is that they take out their smartphone, you know, their Samsung, their, you know, their iPhone 10 their iPad at home, and they they're, they're have this certain experience in the consumer space, and then they go to work, and like they, I said, they step back into the 1990s. Um, so, I mean, that's starting to percolate up, is that there's more clinician demand for having better user experience. We take a really rigorous uh, uh, evidence-based approach to user experience, is that you need to demonstrate it to us in our usability lab. So, we have a 6,000 square foot usability facility within Toronto General that we do usability testing on hundreds and hundreds of products, uh, IT related medical devices. And so you're going to prove your, the merit of the user experience of your, of your product through rigorous usability testing. Thank you so much, Joe.